Hey, we're alive. <laughs> how you doing? I'm all right. How are you? Adam, who I kept calling Adam for the first few days you I met are you. Not the only person. Do you just let it slide? Usually. <laughs> well, it's good to have you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So, yeah. Franciscan, uh, are you a freshman? Are you? I'm a junior. Oh, how's it going? Going well. I'm, I'm enjoying my classes. I really like Franciscan. Why? Why? Um, it's radically different than every other college experience I've seen. I went to a school down in Florida my freshman year right out of high school and I visited my friends at Indiana University, Purdue University, secular colleges and it's it's completely different. The atmosphere is different. It's the opposite of those schools. At Franciscan you have people that push you in the faith and in virtue. If you if you go to IU, your friends will ask you the next morning, why didn't you go to that party? What, what happened? Where were you? You go to Franciscan. Dude, why did you go to that party? It's worlds different. And in terms of growth as a person, I would, I would not be studying philosophy anywhere else. Mm. I'd not be in community like I am anywhere else. I heard somebody say that at Franciscan, even though if you want to, party and not participate in the church life on campus it's a possibility it's harder and that the peer pressure is to actually be holy absolutely is that right what about academics like do you find that the school's great in the, in that it kind of helps you be holy but the professors aren't i mean i'm hoping you say no that they're terrific but so <laughs> but. obviously i i do believe that the academics at franciscan are fantastic the professors are caring and merciful and care for you as a student like I've, I've never seen before. No one is going to believe that this is not an advert for Franciscan. <laughs> you can pay me Franciscan if you're watching. What I will say is I've noticed the temptation in myself because the professors are so merciful. Sometimes you can get away with not going to a class yeah. and then writing an email about why you needed a... a mental health day or no that's um, a thing oh that's that's a thing that's a thing do you need a doctor certificate for a mental health day no what do you think my wife would say if i told her i needed a mental health day i need to leave her and the kids at home so i, I think can... she'd laugh <laughs> I think she'd laugh at you uh, no but i mean it is great and the classes are rigorous you you can get as much out of them as you put in if you go to teacher's office hours yeah. you ask questions you participate in class you can extract the height of knowledge, like, like, how do I want to put this? Like university was meant to be that scholastic element that you see from the middle ages where there's community and there's yeah. pursuit of knowledge ordered towards a higher good that exists at Franciscan that I haven't seen anywhere else. Hmm. When did you come here? When did you start? 2020. That's okay. my first year at Franciscan. Wow. And then you're in the priestly discernment program? I am not no. in the priestly discernment oh, okay. program at Franciscan. I was my freshman year here, but I'm not anymore. All right. no, I did not last long in the... What is PBA. that? Is that just if you're coming to the university and you're discerning the priesthood, you can live with other men who are discerning? Is that what it is? So they all live on the same wing of one of the dorms, uh, St. Junipero Sarah Hall. Uh, they have their own wing and they live... In close community, there are two households of the PDP. Households are pretty big at Franciscan. It's not its not the same as a fraternity or sorority, but they are communities of people engaged in either the same social events or centered around particular charisms. Uh, they go to mass together. So the PDP is, there are two households within the PDP under a chaplain. So Father Jonathan mm. McElhone is, is their chaplain right now. And they pray together. So they'll have like morning prayer after 6.30 a.m. mass. They do morning prayer together, usually at breakfast together. There's maybe evening prayer. There are commitments that they have to make. So there's requirements. You need to go to three morning prayers a week. Okay. Or there's a Thursday night formation night where they have a holy hour in front of the exposed blessed sacrament. Praise hymns afterwards. There's night prayer. Nice. And there's some sort of formation talk. Maybe they'll bring someone in. And it's an opportunity to grow and be in community with other men discerning the priesthood. Figure out where you want to be. 
and receive advice from priests, talk to people. Yeah. So I want to get to how you started discerning the priesthood, and I, I got a lot of questions about that, but for those who aren't aware of you, how did you come into the Catholic faith, or how did it become an important thing in your life? Originally, I came into the Catholic faith when I was six years old. I was baptized. My parents made that decision. I was six, but I don't remember it at all. Hmm. I was not raised, however, with Catholic formation. So by the time I got into high school, I I knew almost nothing about the Catholic faith. We we would go to a you know a non denominational church here or a Methodist church for Christmas, or mm -hmm. a family friend would invite us to this Presbyterian church. We'd go there, or something, something. There was no solid and uniform foundation. It was just loose Christian morality. Um, so by the time I got into high school, I was not a a firm believer. I wasn't. I didn't have a, a rock of intellectual formation to fall back on. Were your friends Christian? Some of them. Uh, most of them were, were evangelicals who also went to non-denominational type churches. Mm -hmm. But not not all of them at all. I'd fallen into, by sophomore year, I'd, I'd fallen into some friend groups that were wholly not Christian. Even if, even <laughs> okay. if professed. I see. Not my not lifestyle. Like that. Yeah. Right. And so I believed in God. There was I don't think there was a point at which I would have called myself an atheist agnostic maybe but i don't think i would have been confident in calling myself that more so just uncertain of the christian revelation so by the time i got into sophomore year oh man i was i was a problem child absolutely getting into getting into trouble left and right it got pretty bad to the point where i lost a lot of friends people didn't want to associate themselves with me hmm. and I was completely lost. I had to begin asking myself bigger questions. And somehow I was drawn into the Catholic faith. Uh, like I mentioned, we would bounce around between churches. And I don't, I don't want to say that in a, in a... We were we would attend different churches from time to time. And I believe one Christmas we went to the local Catholic church. My mom took us, my sister and I. And I saw someone in one of my classes, in my orchestra class, he was an altar server. And I was mystified. Hmm. I, he was the one swinging the incense. Mm -hmm. And beyond all the, the preaching and the things I didn't understand or didn't really care about, I saw my friend doing something other, something otherworldly, something mystical, participating in religion in a totally different context to how you usually saw him too. absolutely yes and i'd always been interested in maybe i'll call it the virtue of religion i had a little phase i wasn't i, I wouldn't have called myself buddhist or anything but i was just interested in all these eastern philosophies and mm -hmm. the word <laughs> mystical would come up every other sentence <laughs> and reading the tradition of these ascetic monks who would fast for long periods of time and I have these divine visions and that was always fascinating to me seeing the ritual and ceremony of religion so the next day i saw my friend in the class i had with him it was orchestra class and i said hey drew what was that and he said you know i was uh, we we have this program in our diocese it's it's actually spread to a couple dioceses called the knights of the holy temple so centered around altar serving yes but it's also faith formation and fraternity for young men i said i want to do that and so he asked me if i'm catholic and <laughs> i said i think so you know i my family goes to mass sometimes i was baptized catholic i don't know the first thing about the religion but i believe in god and that's cool and i want to do it so really, I was introduced to the faith through altar serving. And I remember I went to the pastor of that parish. And basically, he boiled it down to, if I am baptized and he hears my confession, then I'm good to go for altar serving. 
So I had training. I had a bit of study, learning what confession was. <laughs> Went to my first confession. How old? 15. Mm-hmm. 15 sounds right. Maybe 16. No, 15. So I was altar serving and I, I fell in love with it. Everything about it, trying to be precise mm. with the movements. Precise, but not... Robotic? Not robotic, mm. not militaristic. One thing we emphasized was the pivot. So if you were walking in procession yes. and then you quickly pivot, <laughs> yes. it looks really quite unnatural. It does. So everything about it was this saunter, this dance. And I wow. I was so interested in in the fluidity of it, the motion of it. And was, of it course, the, was it the Latin mass you were mm, attending? No. But it was a reverent Novus Ordo by the sound of it. It was, yes, yes. It was, it was a, it was, so it was a reverent Novus Ordo in the fact that this priest was a wise and learned priest who cared about the liturgy. Mm -hmm. It was not reverent Novus Ordo. Everyone talks about with the ad orientum, mm -hmm. Latin chant and all this. No, mm -hmm. but it was a, it was a well done mm -hmm. Novus Ordo that could also appease the population that was not interested in orthodoxy. Ah, or, or more traditional, yeah. Right. Liturgy. So as I was altar serving more and more, I, I detached myself. I began to detach myself from everything else. And I just became enraptured by it. There was one summer where I just, I picked up the Bible and I just started reading and it was all I did wake up, read, go to sleep. In about two weeks, I got through the majority of the Old Testament before wow. I talked to my priest. What a gift from the Holy Spirit to have that hunger. Absolutely. Looking back on it, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was immense. And in our monthly meetings for the altar server group, we had these adult confreres. They were mentors to us. They were guides. And we'd be looking at the schedule of masses through the month. And I remember at one of the meetings, someone paused and said, wait, uh, Adam, you're scheduled for three masses this Sunday. And I just, is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't a problem to me. I, I was like, more mass, the better, right? Why not serve three masses a weekend? I'd be there. I'd live at that church if I could. Wow. And... They were all... So did I, you have to sign up for three masses? Mm, yeah. I put my name down on, okay, on three slides. I see. And so just being in proximity to the priest in the sanctuary and the Eucharistic sacrifice and having a different perspective than just being in the congregation and the necessity of maintaining decorum, that recognizing when you're up on the sanctuary... They ought not be, but people might be looking at you. Mm -hmm. So you can't just be sitting there scratching your ear mm -hmm. and wandering off. You have to focus. And even if you're not focused, you have to give the representation of focus. Mm -hmm. So when people see you, they know that something is happening that's important. So I'm, I'm altar serving and I begin to pick up the prayers, right? You, you, you're near, you go to a mass every weekend, you go to multiple masses every weekend, you're serving throughout the week, maybe you do a funeral here or there. And so you begin to to hear and memorize these prayers just from repetition. And so I'm at home and I've I've heard the way different priests do it. And uh in our vesting room, altar servers would sometimes we'd make fun of innocently, we'd make fun of a certain priest who had a really interesting accent mm -hmm. in the way he he sang yes. one of the Eucharistic prayers. It was funny. It was very funny. And so we'd laugh about it. But in that imitation of the priest and mocking their, their accent or the way someone said it or mm -hmm. the gestures they did, there was something deeper going on. There was there was some movement we would enjoy 
this mimicry of the priest. And I just, I fell in love. That's, that's, that's the short answer is I fell in love. And so while serving, I actually had my first communion as an altar server. I was serving before I had my first communion. I remember, oh, wow. I remember I was, I was not only in this time of reading the Bible, but going through apologetics because I had those evangelical friends I would talk about. They, they were some of the, the, the first people who taught me unconditional love hmm. besides my parents, of course, my family, because I would get in trouble. I would do things that ostracized me from other people, but those Christian friends would stay with me and they would pray for me and they'd give me advice and when necessary rebuke because it is necessary sometimes. Mm -hmm. But they would ask me, okay, it's great that you're pursuing the Lord. You're coming to Jesus. Our prayers are being heard. However, however, <laughs> <laughs> why over there? Why don't you, why don't you come and, and come to church with us? And I'd been to non-denominational churches before. I'd been to these evangelical congregations, these mega churches with Father Jim Bob, who are, or, or Pastor, Pastor Jim Bob. Yeah. yeah. And most of these were the, the more rock concert type congregations mm -hmm. where there's just this, this huge emotional spirit and everyone's got their hands up and there's, there's a drum set and this plexiglass cage and, and it's, it's rock music, 45 minute sermon, rock music. Mm -hmm. yeah, just a brief aside, when you came in here, you asked me about this relic of St. Thomas Aquinas that we have here in the studio. And I was just thinking how, out of place a reliquary would seem at a place like that you know like what's that well that's the femur bone of pastor steve <laughs> why right. there's something about the catholic liturgy where the liturgy and death is is comfortable yes you know yes but, but it's not like that with a rock concert yeah no and before i even knew anything about religion going to these rock concert congregations there was nothing of substance i didn't enjoy being there i hmm. at best would would derive some message of general morality so when they would invite me to these congregations there was there was just nothing nothing there nothing there for me nothing and it wasn't it how do i want to put this it's not like i'm going to church just so i can get something out of it I'm not saying I didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. It's like I didn't perceive that there was anything there. To be got. To be gotten. Mm. But when I went to Catholic masses, something with this ritual and ceremony, when I altar served, when you swing the incense, when there's a ritual, when there's motion, when there's a separated sanctuary and congregation, when there are steps up to the altar, when there's something other, mm -hmm. you don't know what it is, but it's other. It's this holy, holy, holy thing. It's, it's, it's attractive. It's mystical. What more do you want? And so I began to study apologetics. And when my Protestant friends would, would give me reasons I shouldn't be Catholic, some of them made sense. But I do my research. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And I recall, it's rather embarrassing looking back at it, but I, I give myself a hard time. It's kind of funny. As an altar server, we had our little group chat. And I was talking to the fellow altar servers about why I shouldn't be going to evangelical churches and becoming Protestant and all this. Mm -hmm. And they would laugh, they'd roast Protestants. And I remember one day I said, well, slow down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We worship Mary. So that's not great either. You said that I thinking said that. that? I, but you thought that? Or were you yeah, joking? Yeah. Oh, I mean, okay. I, didn't, I didn't know anything about Catholicism at this point. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I just read some Bible, altar served a couple <laughs> times. Have you seen uh, Pat Madrid's comment uh, looking at the children of Fatima, right? So there's a statue of Mary. 
And then you've got the three children of Fatima, who are also statues. And he says, not only do Catholics worship statues, our statues worship statues as well. That's great. I love that. <laughs> That's a joke you can only make when you're thoroughly now convinced that, of course, you don't worship statues yeah. or Mary. Yeah. So No, it's fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I became a Catholic. I came into my faith when I was 17 years mm -hmm. old, and I'm really grateful for the interaction I had with my Protestant friends many of whom would put me to shame with mm -hmm. their love of Christ and their, their willingness to be discipled and disciples and to read the scriptures and things like that. But it was really, it was, it was really helpful. There's a lot of misunderstandings. It's also a lot of misunderstandings that Catholics have of Protestants sometimes, and they're not interested in, like it's a lot easier to make fun of someone's position or perceived position than to try to actually understand the nuance of Absolutely. it. That takes effort. Yes. And we're not here for effort. We're here to, we were here to make fun. That's way fun. That's way more fun yeah. to sneer at people than to try to understand them. But okay. So you when did so what did they say in response to that? What did the about you also thinking we worship Mary? <laughs> it was it was just like a shocked sort of no one responded for a while. <laughs> and then <laughs> someone Someone texted me individually and was like, <laughs> they texted hey, you. They <laughs> let's, let's get some coffee sometime. <laughs> but that's, that's all I needed yeah. was someone reaching out and saying, let's, let's talk about this. Well, that's funny. So when you said erroneously, but hey, we Catholics worship Mary. So was that your way of criticizing this doctrine that you didn't fully understand yet? This perceived doctrine? I think it was both doctrinal issue and like a knee-jerk response to my fellow altar servers attacking the faith of my close friends. Oh, I see. Yeah, yes. You were trying to take him down a pig. Yes. Good, yeah. Yes. Because really, we have the gift of faith, and it is a gift. It's beautiful to be in the truth, but it's a gift. And when you see someone who's lacking in truth, what, are you going to make fun of them? Because... They, they haven't received the same knowledge you have. I always thought that about our atheist friends, you know, like during the new atheist craze, which has died down and I'm not sure, not sure if it exists anymore. Thank God. Um, there was a lot of sneering and a lot of mockery. And I think to myself, if I'm really as deluded as you say I am, then you're a mean person for making fun of me. Yes. Like, shouldn't you speak to me in a way that I'd actually be open to hearing so that I can come into the reality with you and your friends? It's just, uh, well, it just goes back to what I said. There's a lot of sneering. That's a word I think the Lord keeps bringing up to me in prayer lately. They try to avoid sneering. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of podcasts that seem to be, that revolve around sneering at our ideological opponents, yes. politically or liturgically. We're just sneering at each other. And, and that does two things. It, 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 it makes us feel superior and it uh, puts us above those we now perceive as inferior. And that's not a good thing <laughs> to do. You said it perfectly. To state the obvious. Yeah. Mm. So, wait, so during your time as an altar server, is that when you started thinking, I could be a priest? I don't think the, the thought was as concrete as that, as clear as that. It was something attractive to me. Certainly. Were your parents happy that you were taking an interest in the Catholic faith? It was keeping me out of trouble. Okay. <laughs> so that's good enough. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. My kid's going to church every Sunday. He's changing up his friends mm. his... were you trying to evangelize your parents because that always goes well <laughs> to to the extent that i was able when when the opportunities arose but it was definitely more of a private affair than it mm -hmm. maybe ought to have been i would do all this research in my room i'd read and, and go through apologetics arguments the amount of time I've spent on the Catholic Answers website yeah, and forums. Yeah. And that's the really interesting thing now is I can engage in a lot of conversations with professors and high intellectuals at Franciscan, and I can understand often what they're talking about when they're referencing some writing of Descartes or this philosopher over here. And I know what they're talking about because I've read a summary of it yeah. or I've seen it referenced in apologetics arguments. Mm-hmm. But I've never actually read the thing. Yeah. So I can keep up with conversations and it's really useful for that. Mm -hmm. But I have I have not actually read a lot of this material. Yeah. But I'm familiar with it. 
And so a lot of that was Catholic Answers, was apologetics. God was, bless Catholic Answers. Absolutely. Do you know how Catholic Answers started? Because I used to work there. So mm -hmm. I know Carl who founded it. And so this was, I think, back in the, oh, forgive me, Carl, I might have this wrong, but I want to say late 80s. Um, yeah, you're going to look it up. Mm -hmm. A group of Protestant or a Protestant must have put flyers on all the windshields of the Catholic cars at the Catholic Church, offering objections to the Catholic Church, why they shouldn't be Catholic. So the next week, Carl got out his, I don't know, computer or <coughs> typed up a response to all of them, had them all photocopied and went to their church and put it under all of their windshields. Wow. And he thought, well, I'm going to come up with a name. I don't want to say like Carl Keating. So he put Catholic Answers and then he bought a P.O. box. And so he did that and he kind of forgot about it and however much time went by. And then he remembered that P.O. box and he went, it was completely stuffed with people who had further questions. Wow. And that's how Catholic Answers started. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. And then there was a story of him and, uh, you know, Patrick Madrid? Him and Patrick Madrid were sitting down one day because this internet thing was becoming more than just a fad. Mm. And so they were thinking, we should get a website. And so they looked and they Catholic.com was available. They're like, oh my gosh, we should, we should, we should probably get that, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine. Cool. So that's how they got it. 1979 is when the flyers went out. So. Wow. wow. I was trying to be generous to Carl. So I was like late eighties, just in <laughs> 79. case. Seventy-nine. But there really was an apologetics awakening here in the United States. And I think it was due to the Protestant culture. Like, I don't think it could have arisen in, well, just like you have like awakenings of Catholic apologetics taking place whenever there's a pushback against the Catholic position, like the, the what are they called, the counter-reformation mm -hmm. within the church mm -hmm. where you have people responding to Calvinists and Lutherans and things like that. Um, but, you know, you've got a lot of very enthusiastic Protestants here in the United States. And a lot of back in the day, 60s, 70s and on, like you're going to hell and, ch and the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon, like that kind of language. Jack Chick type mm -hmm. tracks. Chick tracks. So it was so loud and stark in contrast that it made sense, I think, for this thing to have arisen here. But we're all very much in debt to them, I think. You know, mm -hmm. I was in Uganda a couple of years ago speaking to about 25 church leaders. And I, I was aware as I was speaking to them that I've been blessed to be a beneficiary of the wisdom of people like Keating and Madrid and Hahn. Uh, but these people hadn't heard of a lot of these arguments and i was thinking yeah thank god thank god for these good men having done that but anyway catholic answers so a lot of time spent on their website a lot of time that's awesome yeah and a lot of my friends had objections that were like straight out of a chick tract yeah that were just not you're like correct. come on you're like there are there are decent objections to catholicism mm -hmm. but that one is that is one not a good one <laughs> yeah i don't know where you got that from maybe yeah. you're parroting your parents but that's just not rational and that's happened so many times. But that level of inflammatory aggression towards Catholicism caused me to research harder. Because if someone tells you and you believe it, or, or someone tells you not just like on the street, you're going to hell, but one of your friends says, you are on the road to peril. Mm -hmm. Well, what am I going to do? Sit here and say, eh, no, I'm going to, I'm going to look this up and mm. I'm going to talk to this person and this person. And then in the midst of all this apologetics and altar serving and being led into this dark forest that I didn't understand, but I was just following anyway, along comes a new transitional deacon to our church. And the way it works nowadays is in our diocese, at least you go through all your years of seminary, you're ordained or a deacon. They give you one year as a transitional deacon at, at some parish in the diocese, right? And you serve there for a year and then you go back, do your thing, ordained as a priest and sent somewhere else for your first year as an associate pastor. So we have a new deacon at our parish. We have our pastor who's been there for years, new deacon. This new deacon's a younger guy. He's younger than our parish priest. And so I begin to ask him questions because he's, he's a lot more with the youth. He's, he's involved in a lot more of the youth ministries. He's, mm -hmm. Everyone loves him. And so I ask him these questions. And 
one time he was just like, do you want to go to Starbucks sometime and let's, let's, and I don't know what it was for me that, that did it. But when he asked me to go to Starbucks, something in me about my understanding of, of priests just broke. It was just, hmm. You can leave this location. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that they were human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and so I met with him at Starbucks. And I'm like, well, he's he's an ordinary guy. He's extraordinary, but he's a guy. Mm -hmm. And so we met. And for his year at our parish as a transitional deacon, I grilled him with questions over and over again. I'd have these objections from my Protestant friends, and I'd do my research and I'd come up with these <clears throat> these high lofty questions that that no other 16 year old is asking mm -hmm. I, I anyway no no other 16 year old that I was aware of because I I tried to find the answers they were not amongst my peers if one of my evangelical friends could explain penal substitutionary atonement mm -hmm. that would have been lovely they could not mm -hmm. but I kept grilling him with questions but eventually his transitional deacon year was was over. In that time, as he was preparing for the priesthood, he, I know that he prayed for me and fasted for me. And not, not his answers to the questions, but his prayers led me to say yes to the church. Hmm. So at this point, he leaves, he's gone for some time, and I go back to our pastor and say, I'd like to be confirmed in the church. What do I need to do? He says, I trust you know what you're doing. You've asked enough questions. You know, <laughs> you know more than every kid in the confirmation class. You know what you're doing. And so I was confirmed. And after I was confirmed, we, the diocese changes up the priestly assignments every June, I think. And so we receive our new associate pastor, and what do you know? It's that mm. transitional deacon. So the year I I said yes to the Catholic Church is the year he was ordained as a priest. And we are great friends to this day. Mm. To this day. Yeah. Awesome. So at what point did you decide, I think I might be interested in the seminary? <clears throat> like I said with the altar serving it was not a it wasn't a clear thought i couldn't form the sentence i want to be a priest or i ought to go to seminary until years later but looking back now there was mm. this slow draw through the liturgy through meeting priests and spending time with them recognizing them as human as really great humans falling in love with the church's teaching on vocation on the sacraments on the sacramental life i wrote a letter actually to a to my vocations my diocesan vocations director back in 2019 and it was looking back on it it's it's one of the worst things i've ever written it's it's just this long rambling flow of not i don't want to say nonsense but looking back on it it was less of a formal letter of help me with my discernment or give me guidance on where i should go looking back on it and reading it with someone else who i know who is a wise and holy person much older than me and I said, this is so cringy. I, don't, I cannot believe that I, I said these things. This is, and I wrote this to an another adult male. And he said, stop. Maybe this isn't the best formal letter you could have mailed into the bishop's office. But you wrote a love letter. Okay. It was a love letter. In this letter, I wrote about the, the desires of my heart and how yeah. I fell in love with the liturgy and how I fell in love with... I think that's beautiful. I think the bishop probably would have appreciated that because it's easy to write a kind of stuffy, particular, you know, technically correct letter to say the right things, but to kind of bear your heart to say, 
I love Jesus Christ mm-hmm. and I think he's called me to be a priest. Yeah. That must be a refreshing letter, I'd think. But I don't even know if the sentence, I think he's called me to be a priest, uh, was in there. It, I had a story about how I had this dream, not a dream, like a sleep dream, mm-hmm. but just a fantasy about going to France and, and selling all my positions and possessions, going to live in a cave in France and and being a hermit and going to, I mean, living in the streets in, in absolute poverty, but yeah. going to a chapel and receiving our Lord every day in the Eucharist. And I talked about the, the call of poverty and how I fell in love with the church's teaching on chastity growing up in, in this wicked culture, mm-hmm. wicked. I mean, looking back on it, some of those friends I had in high school and the things that we talked about, the things that we did, the things that we idolized, horrible, absolutely horrible. And to me, looking back, it is, it is no doubt a miracle of grace that at any point I could have written a letter praising chastity when all I did was listen to this music that objectified women when my friends would go to parties, when we go to parties and, and, and talk about girls and all we did was talk about girls as if they were, as if they were objects, as if, and somewhere in the midst of that, I wrote a letter about the beauty of chastity and poverty. When I'd listen to rap music about gold chains and flexing mm. and I'd go with my friends and, and buy expensive clothing and we'd put together these outfits and we'd see each other in the hallways, compliment, you know, the, the drip, the swag, whatever. But in my heart, I wanted poverty mm-hmm. and I was in love with poverty. And I was willing to sacrifice those friends for the sake of the poverty and the chastity and the, the religious vocation because I wasn't quiet about it. I had these same non-religious party friends and I'd be with them. We'd be skipping classes. We'd be doing this and that. It's like, I think I want to be a priest. That'd be cool. Mm. And a lot of times it's just, okay. Uh, <laughs> just this awkward, you know, shrugging it off. There's a story of sister Mary Crockett. Have you heard of her? Yeah, I have. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about her, but I know um, the name. I, I, an Irish nun who has a story of, of her conversion. And she's got like, she's at a pub with her friends, like a beer in one hand, a cigarette in the other. Says, I think I want to be a nun. <laughs> and not that exact scenario, but I have had so many moments like that. Yeah. I want to ask you about poverty. You shared that experience of saying you know, what you thought Catholics taught about Mary. So let me share an embarrassing story with you that like, I'm going to regret telling Go after I tell yes. it. So I'm about 20, 20 years old, maybe 19. And I watch Brother, Son, Sister Moon, mm. which is this like really corny movie about St. Francis. I was so moved by it <laughs> that I broke my mobile phone. Like, yes. literally just broke it. Yes. And it wasn't a new cool one. It was like the old brick ones because mm. I'm 100. And then I filled up a bag of my clothes and walked barefoot <laughs> to the, uh, you know, like donation center, you know. Point is, about a month later, I'm sure I had another phone. And But here's, here's the question, right? Yeah. Because what is poverty? Because poverty in one sense is a lack that's what we mean. And you can't love a lack because a lack isn't anything. So when you say you love poverty, what do you mean? And um, or am I or am I mistaken? In no, my no, I think I think you're completely right. I think I loved the detachment because of the freedom it gave me. I see. Uh, yeah. maybe I can because that's right. You can only love things. You can't love things that don't exist. And so if poverty is merely that, the absence of things, you can't love that except for what it gives you. So I see the freedom. So would you mm-hmm. can see that freedom is, is a thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I, I loved the freedom, freedom that poverty opened up. Yeah. And how are you experiencing that in your life as a young man? Or, or do you mean in the future you hope to attain it? There were, there were on and off times, sometimes when it would be, some social affair, some road trip, some, some something 
that we'd all been hyping up for a while. And there was a lot riding on it. Sometimes I just say, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I'll just, I will stay home and read the Bible this weekend. Mm -hmm. There is a really good narrative in there. And I really like this story. I don't think I can make it tonight, guys. And that's such a small thing. I mean, how many times any introverts know, you know, <laughs> yeah, saying like, no to a social function <laughs> is nothing. Yeah. <clears throat> but for me, I would have, I would have put myself on the line, my life on the line to be accepted socially. Mm. And so it wasn't due to just merely being unsocial that no, you wanted to stay home. No, it was, I don't know what it is, but there's something better. Mm. There's something other, there's something more, there's more. That's, yeah. that's probably the best way to put it. Father Bob Bedard was the founder of the Companions of the Cross in Canada. Mm -hmm. He has a line that I've, I'll never forget. He said, since discernment has become fashionable, no one's made a decision since. <laughs> right? um, yes. So how, how has that been true or not true? in your life and in the lives of those around you? Because I think that is a critique. Even this morning, I had a had men's group at 8 a.m. with a few fellows here, and one of the guys I was with, Brian Kissinger, was saying, you know, in his experience, when a young woman, like, knows she's called to become a nun to the convent, like, she'll quit. She'll go right away, leave, like, quit the... Uh, quit school midway and he said that hasn't been his experience with a lot of men with a lot of and maybe this isn't true maybe this is unfair which is partly why i'm asking you but he said for a lot of men it's like yeah well i'm thinking about the priesthood so you know after i finish school and maybe work for a couple of years and maybe date then i'll become a priest uh, that that might be unfair but what's your experience being in discernment and not wanting to hide behind the word discernment that is a major problem and i'm glad you pointed that out because discernment is a is a recognition of a call, but it involves decision making. Ooh, very well put. You you receive a call, but you have to say yes to it. And not just this greater yes of <clears throat> I'm open to being led, but along the way, there are hard forks in the road and you have to choose one or the other. And that's something I I am only now learning through making mistakes. So for one, if you have a reasonable, I don't want to say certainty, but if you have a reasonable suspicion mm -hmm. that you're being called to a religious vocation, why would you date someone? And I, I will get a lot of flack for that. I've heard a lot of arguments to the contrary. Mm. But if you are reasonably confident that you're being led to a religious vocation, entering a relationship with someone, it's not, you're not the only party involved. It's not, I'm going to try this and discern in my heart if this is working and if I'm being led this way. You're, maybe in the secular terms, you're leading someone on to break their heart. If you're not, there's a difference between an, an honest mistake where you date someone because you feel like you're being led to a relationship with that person, which may end in marriage. You could see yourself spending your life with this person and that ends up not being the case. And maybe that's, that's tough. It hurts. It hurts both people. It's sad. We live in a broken world. It, it happens. But for you to say, I'm not sure about this. I don't know if, mm, I don't know. Should I get a spiritual director? Should I this, that, or the other? No, I'll take it upon myself to discern and date over here and pray like this and do this. And that's why I, someone said that the hardest one of the evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience hmm. is not poverty or chastity. It mm -hmm. is obedience mm -hmm. because so many people, mm. so many men do whatever they want, whatever they want. And even up to, up to mental health days. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. I'm sure there are legitimate reasons for mental health days, but but yeah, so not in my an, case. But, there's, a, but there's an excuse to always remove yourself from an obligation you may have agreed to. Yes. Yes. So when it comes to getting yourself a spiritual director, 
when it comes to sending a letter to your vocations director, start, do something, say yes. If you're experiencing a call, send a letter to someone, write an email, text someone. Because you're not the, you're not the one who places desires upon your heart. Hmm. The, the analogy I've used, which I'm not sure if it's entirely correct, but if you're put into a, an MRI machine or a cat's, what's the one that does the brain? Yeah. Um, M fMRI. fMRI, Scan. sure. And someone flashes images in front of your eyes, a puppy and oh, then okay. green grass and then the sun and then the Latin mass and then <laughs> a guitar and then, and they're scanning your brain and they see it light up and this and that uh -huh. and the other. You're not the one who's, you're not in control of how you respond to things. Right. To a certain extent, you can choose how you react, but certain things will excite you. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not the one who created your desires. So if something is attractive to you, if there's a desire on your heart that might authentically be from the Lord, quite honestly, who are you to say no? Who are you to not explore that? Okay. So you have something that might be a call to religious life. Send an email to someone. Your diocesan vocations director is a great place to start because I, th I think there's this myth that wherever you first contact, they're going to want to sucker you in. Um, no, because yeah. there's nothing worse. I think, I think any Catholic can see what bad priests can yeah. do. So it's like, it's like, don't flatter yourself. Don't People flatter aren't yourself. falling over themselves to get you into the seminary. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <clears throat> so if you, if you write your diocesan vocations director, they have resources. They can say, okay, well, let me put you in contact with this religious order. I think mm -hmm. you, you'd really like this priest that I've met. Let's get you a spiritual director who can help you figure out what's going on in your heart. That's one of the biggest parts of discernment is learning to read your own heart, looking at mm -hmm. your past and your life story. Um, I, used, I was discerning the Capuchins for a while. Mm. Um, I just love St. Francis, right? Brother, son, sister, moon, breaking my phone, baby. And so I was discerning the Capuchins, and um, I spoke to one Capuchin over a phone one day. He said something that I'd love your opinion on. I think it's excellent. He said, don't be afraid of your shallow desires for a particular vocation. He says, just like in marriage, the thing that attracts you to this woman isn't necessarily something deep and profound. It might just be like, she's got a beautiful face and I like her laugh. <laughs> like these are not reasons, right, to get married, right. but it's the beginning. It the beginning. And he said, so if what's attracting you to the Franciscans is their habit looks cool, he's like, don't be afraid of that. That's okay. You don't have to pretend mm -hmm. that your desire for this particular religious order or to be a priest is mystical and deep when it can just begin very superficially. And when he said that, something in me relaxed and I realized like, okay, it's okay to be attracted to, the, to these things in the beginning on a, at a superficial level. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I think one of the problems that I see underlying that is like false humility hmm. to say that, oh no, no, I'm, uh, I, I recognize that desire for aesthetics as, as merely something worldly, but I subjugate the flesh and I can see the heart of it. Like, shut up, man. I you see. think it's cool. Just, yeah. just say that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly like that. It's exactly like dating and you're first drawn to the outward appearance. Outward probably. appearance. But you have to take it deeper. If you're first drawn to the outward appearance, you don't just stare at someone. You don't just. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. You don't just go to the port you and out. pray about this beautiful person for the next 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. You go and initiate a conversation. Yeah. And maybe that goes somewhere. Maybe you invite them to grab coffee, to get lunch, to go on a date. The same thing with discernment. Something interests you. You don't say, and then go and talk to your friends and say, oh, well, there's this cool thing and maybe I'm, I'm experiencing this call, but I'll, I'll wait until the Lord makes it more clear. Mm-hmm. He's made it clear just from that, that little shallow desire. Mm. That's in, that's all you need. Start there. 
How did you discern whether or not you wanted to pursue the path of a religious vocation as opposed to a diocesan priestly vocation? Did that take some time? For yes. me, I didn't. I come from a very um, rural diocese in South Australia. I think geographically speaking, it's the third largest in the world. It's wow. just huge. Mm -hmm. And so my bishops done a lot of driving, a lot of flying, and there's a lot of. And we haven't had, I don't think, a home. We haven't had a vocation in like, like I was like twenty years, maybe more. Wow. Maybe, you know, maybe thirty. Wow. So we have these fellows who are coming in from Malaysia and Africa, and that's great, but there's nothing coming in from our own diocese. And so there was just a lot of older kind of men living on their own. I'm like, I don't want to be a bachelor. Like, I want to live, if I'm going to do this, I want to live in community with other brothers who can call me to. But I'm sure if you desire to be a diocesan priest, it's not like you're like, no, I don't want that. I want to be alone. It's like, no, of course we all want brothers, but. So how was your how was your discernment with that been? I began discerning with religious orders. I thought for a while I was going to be a Dominican. I discerned with the Institute of Christ the King, sovereign priest. I was shopping around. I I was attracted to a lot of things in these various communities because they have attractive qualities. All mm -hmm. of them do. Yeah. But recognizing attractive qualities is different than being attracted to something and figuring out if that's where your heart is being led. I think... Yeah, fair enough. Anyone can recognize a beautiful woman. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you are called <laughs> to go and... That's that right. Just because there's date. 10 beautiful women in a room, it doesn't mean you're called to every one of them. Exactly. Exactly. So... Let me step back. I've always, not always, I've been interested for some time, even through high school, in the extremes of human discipline. I'm not a disciplined guy. I won't say that. I've been interested in it. I've been interested in things like the special forces mm. in the military, Navy SEALs looking at their, their training, <clears throat> excuse me, especially their hell week looking at Buddhist monks and their extreme fasting. Mm. One of the first Christian saints that I had a devotion to was St. Simon the Stylite, who stood atop a pillar for 40 years. <laughs> uh, they would, and he gradually increased stood. the height of the, the pillar. How was he sleeping? He would, he would, I believe he'd crouch, like get down on his hands and knees. They on a found pillar? His, yes. How did he not fall off? It's a great question. <laughs> the grace of God. The grace of God, obviously. All right. But for, for, for 30 years or something, and they would build the pillars higher and higher. <laughs> and someone would have a pulley and pull him up a basket of, of bread yeah. like once a week. Yeah. But that was cool to me. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's very cool. It'd be weird. We should do that in Steubenville. What the hell is Frank doing up on that ladder? Well, he feels saint. cool to it. He's being a saint. I wish he'd stop. It's very annoying <laughs> seeing him. And I, I reminds I, I, the reason I'm joking is without the grace of God, that's that clearly is just this look at me. Mm. But I'm not saying he was like that. He's a saint. But for me, it would totally be a look at me. Yeah. It reminded me of a conversation that Thomas Merton had with his spiritual director, who said to Thomas, "You want to be a hermit in the." middle of New York City with a big neon sign and an arrow pointing saying, here is a monk. Wow. Uh, Someone said that to Thomas Burton? I think it was his spiritual father. Wow. And if, I don't know, but if it came from Merton, uh, that uh, who, whatever. <laughs> but that's certainly an act of humility to acknowledge that. Yes. Like to acknowledge like, yeah, I want to be a monk. I want everyone to see me being a monk mm -hmm. on my own. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I think that's also one of those shallow draws too, though, that can be. It's like when you're a kid and you, you do good things um, because you want to be recognized for it. And mm. then as you grow up, you realize you want to do it for the sake of the good thing. That's a good point. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Great point. But yeah, that, that, that kind of rigorous, that is what attracts young men, isn't it? Yes. Even if like, uh, like I went into a rectory once in this, uh, uh, this priest told me a joke. He said he went to a Franciscan friary. 
And the priest said, wow, if this is poverty, show me chastity. Because it, <laughs> it wasn't at all. You know, like, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's easy to idolize these things. And maybe when we get there, we're not as thrilled. Like I spoke to a religious order who was a new religious order in Australia. And I was talking about how excited I was about poverty, which is to, you know, but I didn't, I wasn't excited at all about poverty. I was excited about the idea of it. But he's like, well, you won't be as excited when your car doesn't work and you've got no yeah. money to get where you need to go. It's yeah. like, oh, okay, now I. I see how I wouldn't be excited about that, but, um, but yeah, but no, as a young man, like that's why the friars of the renewal appealed to me. I'm like, these men sleep on the floor. They don't have cars or maybe they have a communal car in New York. I don't know, mm. but you know, they, last they I beg checked, for their food. Yeah. 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 Last I checked, they have one truck that was donated to them. I, I discerned with them for a while. I Father love Gabriel, those guys. Amazing. Love them. Have you gone and stayed with them? I'm not. Mm. You afraid if you did, you'd want to stay forever? I'm afraid of that now and I'm married. It is it is an attractive life. <laughs> I think I think that's part of the male fantasy, this this yearning to just run away and do something extreme. Yes. Yeah. We should want that. Cast off all this nonsense. I mean Yes. This is table, man. What do I need a table for? Forget just it. Flip the table and go <laughs> run into the woods. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think if a man doesn't have that desire, that's not good. In fact, I've got the brothers Karamazov here. Within mm. the first few pages of the of the book, as the author is talking about uh Alyosha, he talked about his idealistic sense. I don't know if you remember that, but he said something like a young man ought to have that. Like even if it's naive, like good. A man without that, where's he gonna go? But yeah, and then do you think maybe what we do is we just sort of satiate that desire with like uh, video games, potentially? I'm not demonizing all video games, but I'm saying that if you have this desire for something radical, you could do something radical or you could be like, play Age of Empires 2, which is awesome, by the way, and like dominate another tribe or something. Satiate, numb, ignore. I think... Those are all true, but I also think the intermediary stages are often what's lost. So if you have a young man as a desire and sees the Navy SEALs, that's amazing. I want to be that. Yeah. Okay. What's in between ah. you, you fat, lazy slob, mm -hmm. and becoming a Navy SEAL? Well, I have to get out of bed. I have to work out maybe the first day because you're, you're on that high of this is like a fantastic idea. But then when it gets grueling, when it gets difficult, yeah. when it has to be sheer will and that attraction has gone, it just you give up. So true. I love that. The intermediary, that's where we get lost. We as a fat slob, as you put it so well, see someone, not a flat fat slob, want to be that thing. This is what we're all going to do. As December approaches and all of the gyms put out their 50% off signs, <laughs> appealing to the desire we have to be better, but knowing that once we sign the paperwork, we'll decide we don't want to be better necessarily because that's for like vain people or something. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll get lost in the intermediary stages. That's so true, dude. This is why it's so important to have a rule of prayer, I think. It's like, yes. as yes. opposed to, I just go with the spirit. It's like, that's probably you just being lazy yes. and flaky. Yes. So Absolutely. you can go with the spirit, but you also need set times when you pray. Like yes. When you wake up, before you go to bed. And if you can't commit to that, then don't even pretend that one day you could be a saint or a priest. Or... Yes. And I think you, you just hit on the, the schedule of prayer. That's been in the church's patrimony since the beginning. The divine office, the liturgy of the hours. Mm. Originally, I, I struggled really greatly with the liturgy of the hours. I had my spiritual director would recommend maybe just morning and night prayer every day. Not the evening prayer. The evening prayer is kind of long. Mm -hmm. Just the night prayer. Two bookends to the day. You start your day. Here's my intent. You end the day. You reflect, repent, get ready for the next day. And I struggled with it quite a bit. Sometimes I Sometimes it's just forgetting and sometimes it's just this boring yeah. reading of these psalms. Dude. But I realized I started to pray when I visited the Canons Regular of the New Jerusalem mm -hmm. in Charlestown, West Virginia, and they do everything in the old form. Okay. Once I started praying, I got this app on my phone called IPATA, 
And I yeah. started praying the divine office in the old form. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'd just read the Latin because it was interesting. I don't, yeah. I don't speak Latin. I don't know Latin. But sometimes I'd read the English translation. And even that English translation is just better. Okay. And I don't know what version of the Bible they use for, for the Liturgy of the Hours I have in, in the new form. But recognizing the difference in translations, these little things, mm -hmm. just switching up the language I pray or even the translation of the Bible changes my, my prayer. Okay. And so now for anyone discerning religious vocation, absolutely the scheduled yeah. prayer of the, the divine office, the lectionary, this <clears throat> extension of the mass, these are... I love it. Yes, necessary. I love it because what you're doing is you're calling someone into the intermediary to see if they'll be satisfied to you know sweat it out there because mm. it'd be like someone saying look i want to be like really in shape and the person says okay well uh do you work out no but i really want to just look terrific mm. and i want to have a lot of energy and the person says, okay well why don't we start just coming to the gym like just uh, twice a week you know so you're calling him into that intermediary if they don't show up for that or if they can't be consistent in that then just just be honest. Just mm -hmm. say, I don't want to be in shape. Just right. say that. Right. That's okay. That's a choice you can make. But I love that. It's like, if you want to be a priest, it's like, all right, then here's what I invite you to do. Pray some of these hours. Yeah. The reason I was just looking on my phone then is um, I've been praying the first hour each morning for a while mm -hmm. of the Eastern prayers. Oh, wow. And uh, I wrote to Father Jason about a weekend. And I'm like, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. I said, it feels constrictive. I said, you know how Protestants say that all of these like rote prayers kind of get in the way and that's how I feel. And Father Jason is so good at texting me things that sound like they're from some saint in the second century. He's such a good man. He wrote back and said um, that these, these, these specific prayers are, are the bit in the mouth that turns a roaming donkey into a mustang fit for battle <laughs> that's what he said to me they're good that's cool and he said part of being a disciple is being disciplined yes so and then i spoke to father my spiritual father father boniface who said i i, I don't know much about the latin mass unfortunately but in the beginning those um, those psalms that are prayed as the priest approaches the altar mm -hmm. i i guess he's a he if i'm remembering correctly he said some some prayers are more like it's less about what do I get from this and more about going to war mm. and proclaiming the mm. word of God. So it's a different thing when you sit down with your Bible over a cup of coffee and say, how's the Lord speaking to me? That's a beautiful thing. But then there's these hours. It's like you're praying the prayers of the church and it's not so much about you. Right. It's more about the first moments of the day giving worship to God, like making sure that he's the first priority and doing battle with these Psalms. And yes. those two bits of advice have, have really helped me to stay consistent. Yes. Yeah. That's but it's, a, it's hard, man. Yes. The feelings dry up. That's another thing to recognize is when the feelings dry up, any religious vocation, any vocation, <sighs> any religious, yeah. like, any vocation, a Christian. like ask a married man who's been married for more than five minutes if the sex is enough. Or ask any priest who's been a priest for more than five minutes if the shiny vestments are enough. It's like, no, no like at some point you, you're going to have to love Yes, yeah, with the will. Yeah, it's, it's cruciform. That's the nature of vocation. Anyone can be attracted to the incense and the smells and bells and cool vestments and chanting the canon. Mm -hmm. But ask someone, okay, I'll give you an example. We know the, the statistics of the church right now, the clergy, and then it only got worse after COVID. The statistics? What do you mean? How the, many uh, priests there are, how many are in forma formation, uh, how many men are in formation mm -hmm. for the priesthood, how many are over retirement age or will be shortly. So like I said, that usually you go through your seminary, you have your year as a transitional deacon, you're the associate pastor of a small parish for a while under the tutelage of a, of a older pastor, you learn how being a parish priest works firsthand. Then you move on to a larger parish. Maybe you're made the pastor of a small parish or, and then eventually a pastor of a larger parish in your diocese. But things are so bad right now in, I think it's the diocese of Pittsburgh. They're telling their seminarians, when you are ordained, 
you won't come out and be the associate pastor of a small parish. Mm. You will be the pastor of two or three parishes. The average priest in Spain has six parishes under his care. Wow. And I I believe the record is 22 Uh for one priest, 22 parishes. So, you know, it's all cool Latin mass, (laughs) three piece suit, smoke cigars. Everyone wants that. No one wants the being the pastor of three parishes where someone's going to tell you that this is the way we've done it and want to manage your liturgy. And when you can't celebrate that Latin mass, when your parish community reviles you for following the general instruction of the Roman Missal, no one wants to be that priest. Mm -hmm. But that's the nature of that calling is you're called to be a living sacrifice and to offer your life for your sheep. To set your face like flint. Because I can't imagine how well you'd do if you didn't have a backbone as a priest trying to keep everybody happy. You can't do that. Can't. No. So that's, that's another thing, is before the spiritual formation and religious calling, there's just human formation that needs to happen. Yeah. And that's the case with a lot of young men i think that's why jordan peterson is so popular absolutely because he's might not be calling people to spiritual formation but he's certainly calling him to human formation he's saying the most basic things and we're all like that's a great idea i should clean my room and he's right he's right yeah he's right but men aren't hearing that from anywhere else yeah but when they hear it they love it they want to hear it yeah so diocesan priesthood you're more attracted to that right now. He, let me ask you a devil's advocate question, and I'm going to ask it not because I think the things I'm about to say necessarily, but because this is what I'm sure some people say. Okay. Why the hell would you join such a corrupt, depraved church with so many scandals and so many weak, wimpy bishops? Haven't you heard these stories of priests who are going, quote unquote, underground because their bishop silences them? If they're mildly orthodox, they're either sent out into the boonies or sent for therapy. Like, why Why would you subject yourself to that? Why not, I don't know, why not join a religious order where maybe you have some cover if you can trust the religious order or just do something else? Why would any man join the military? You have to go through this horrible boot camp. There are videos of you being in a gas chamber and they come out all mucus running on their face they're coughing it's it's barbaric why would anyone put themselves through that hell because they want to fight for their country because they want to die for their country why would i put myself through the possibility of all these things which are which are real and true because at the end of it there's something greater than my desire and that's to fight for my church. The same priest that I talked to you about, Mm. I was talking to him about the military and and all this. And he said, look, if you're called to go to the military, go join the military. If you're called to be a priest, be a priest. Because I was in my head saying, I don't have the human formation yet. I've lived a a sinful lifestyle. I need to go to the army and, or, or join the Marines and get some discipline and some human formation and be formed enough for formation Mm. in seminary. That's, that's a lie. If God wants you to be somewhere, he will make you ready whenever you need to be ready. So he said, if you're called to the military, military, go to the military. You're called to be a priest, go be a priest. And I want that extreme of the Navy SEALs, of special forces, of the army. I want to be a fighter. I want this. I want that. I want the asceticism and self-discipline of a Buddhist monk. I want the intellectual formation. I want all these things, sure. But at the heart of it, I'm going to do what I'm called to do when I'm called to do it, where I'm called to do it, and I'm ready to fight and die for my country, which is Mm -hmm, the church. mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, it just occurred to me, that's a good answer. It occurred to me as I was asking you that the same thing could be said to anybody who desires to be married. Why would you do that? Haven't you heard about the divorce rates? Your children will break your heart. Mm -hmm. Like... 
yeah, how much money are you going to save for retirement? Like there's so many obstacles, but it's like, yeah, but I'm in love. Yes. And I want to give myself to this person yes. and I want her entirely. So I'm going to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Follow the Lord. Awesome. I want to take a quick break. Absolutely. And then when we get back, we, I want to ask people who are in the live chat right now to send your questions. <clears throat> do me a favor and at pints with Aquinas. So we get your questions ahead of time and uh, we'll go from there. Sweet. Hey, you there looking at me, you know what the number one Catholic app on the app stores is? Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W. It's a prayer and meditation app which is faithful to the teachings of the Catholic Church and is incredibly well produced. Go check them out, hallo.com slash matt, two T's. Um, link is in the description below. If you go and download it on your phone, um, you got to start paying a small amount every month. But if you go to hallow.com slash Matt, you can sign up and you'll get three months for free. It has sleep stories. One thing you might want to do, especially if you're a parent, they have sleep stories for kids. And so getting to play scripture to kids is super cool. Mm -hmm. Also, all of my lo-fi stuff is now over there. I'm just not interested, Matt, because I can't listen to your voice on that. Yeah. Well, you oh, well no. you could. Is that is that the setup? <laughs> yeah, okay, setup, you can. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want to, but if you want to terrify yourself, I mean, if you, speaking of sibling horror, this is far more creepy. <laughs> if you want to listen to me read the Bible to you like this, and you know, I wouldn't want that. Scott Hahn also does. <laughs> yeah, so forget about me. Scott Hahn's there. Jason Everett, Jackie, uh, Francois. So go go check them out. Hallow.com slash Matt. Hallo H A L L O W dot com slash Matt. It's fantastic. And next, I want to say thank you to Parler. You guys have heard about Parler. It is social media the way it was meant to be. I'm over on Parler. So if you click the link in the description below, you can go see my profile and sign up over there. Being on Parler means freedom from reach affecting algorithms and shadow bans. Actually, one thing that's interesting is when I post something on Twitter, versus when I post something on Parler, I actually get more engagement on Parler, even though I've got like 3,000 followers over there and who knows, 50,000 or something followers, I didn't even know, uh, over on Twitter. Um, so you actually get to reach more people because you're not getting banned. It means being free to speak your mind. It means freedom from cancel culture and freedom to grow. So go check out Parler. Click the link in the description below and sign up. Start following me if you want to. We're always posting the videos we're putting here. Uh, Parler knows what it's like to be canceled. They've been there, but they rose from the ashes, never wavering in their free speech mission. The reason is simple. They say that everyone's voices matter. So all on Parler are equal regardless of race, age, religion, politics, or dietary choices. <laughs> um, I don't know if that includes pineapple pizza, but yeah, you, <laughs> it's not just like a conservative platform. It's just a, it's a platform for people who value free speech. So go check them out by clicking the link in the description below, and I'll see you over there. All right, we're back. So I asked a priest uh, if he had any questions. Well, I didn't ask a priest. I asked my local supporters. And a priest sent this. I guess it's for you. My son, if you come forward to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for a temptation. Set your heart right and be steadfast and do not be hasty in time of calamity. Cleave to him and do not depart that you may be honored at the end of your life. There's much more. But that's a. I love that so yeah. much. Accept whatever is brought upon you. And in changes that humble you, be patient, for gold is tested in the fire. And acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. Trust in him and he will help you. Make your way straight and hope in him. That's such a great, ver great. few verses. Great. Hey, before we get to more questions, you were talking about the inter intermary, intermediary stages. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking like one thing that I think that's been a blessing for the church has been uh, Exodus 90. Have you heard of that? Yes. yes, yes. Have you ever done it? It's one of those things that I recommend to people with caution because it's so brutal. It was a priest in my diocese who started the program. And no way. He's also the one that started our Knights of the Holy Temple. Ha, huh, what a guy. What a priest. Great. So, yeah, we, we did it. We went through it together as gentlemen in high school. We had our group and then we had did our... You? Did you make it the 90 days? No. 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 I will. I will be... 
honest with you, not even close. I did a solid Exodus 29. <laughs> yes. And then things started to fall off. <laughs> uh, no, that's that's exactly exactly it. I, I have been up and down with the the attraction to discipline. A lot of it is because I, I have a lot of lack of it. Yeah, and no, I get it. I'm, by the grace of God, building it up slowly. But I've been wrestling with with weakness and sin and mortal sin yeah. for years. Yeah. And I hear a lot of these conversion stories that are great. By the grace of God, it's I live this sinful lifestyle, this, that, and the other. And this, 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 this. And then the last sentence is, and then God saved me from that. But that's not the story. No. The story, that it's completely backwards. You have a life, but your life started in Christ. Yeah. And so now oh, you have this, yeah. this daily struggle yeah but this is where it's just beginning and so that intermediary phase i'm there right now where i'm not in seminary but i'm not in my pre-christian mm -hmm. life and i'm not actively dating so every day i i have to struggle i have to face temptation i want to tell people to go check out exodus 90. yes exodus it's 90 great. exodus 90.com slash matt um and check it out uh, are you tired of over drinking? There's a question. Are you tired of being overly distracted? You could spend 90 days just removing these obstacles from your life. Um, if you're a man who wants to take your spiritual life to the next level, I would highly recommend checking it out. It says tens of thousands of men have made Exodus. They're ready to live different because they're ready to live different. Check it out. Exodus 90. Because they're, everyone, they're doing a... The Exodus 90 kind of starts at a specific time every year um, or a few times every year. So the next time is in January. Mm. So now is the time to decide whether or not you want to do it. And don't just do it the last day when you see an announcement on Facebook that it starts tomorrow. Like, mm -hmm. get ready now. Mm -hmm. Find a small group of men yep. to go through this with you. Because the things people say who are better than me and who actually do stick to it... Like, I was blessed by the time I did it. And then I did make it to 90 days. I was just like being dragged across the finish line by my brothers, to be mm -hmm. quite honest with you. Yes. Sometimes you need that. Yeah. 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 But it's great. Definitely. That, cold that. showers every day. <laughs> the cold showers were the worst for me. Was that I am, a, I am a scorching hot shower guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was it for me? I, honestly, I'm embarrassed to say, I think it was the lack of no alcohol. Hmm. Yeah. I just love like, and it wasn't not from an addictive point of view, but just like, okay, we're out with friends and like, I'll have a water. That was hard. But yeah. That's great. That, that freedom. Definitely. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Mike says, if celibacy is especially a challenge, does that mean I'm called to married life rather than the priesthood? So my knee jerk response is no. But what's been percolating in my mind for a bit is that verse from St. Paul says those who... I'm going to butcher this. Right, let's do it. The, the, those who, if you are like me, it's better to be like me and celibate. Right. But for those who cannot give up their, their lusts or something, it's better that you become married. Than to burn with the lust or something. So, yes, I'm with you. Yes, yeah. Something like that. But I don't know to what extent that, or I guess the, the frequency of that being relevant, because I think, Sure, a lot of guys struggle with lust, but to write yourself off. Yeah. And and on the other end, imagine saying to your wife, I wanted to be a priest, but I can't <laughs> subdue my passion, so I'll settle for you instead. Yeah. Yeah, your wife is not meant to be an outlet. Here's what Paul says. To the unmarried and widows, I say that it is best for them to remain as I am. But if they do not, by which he means celibate and single, but if they do not have self-control, let them get married for it is better to marry than to burn with sexual desire. We still have to reconcile what that means though, because yeah. I'm with you. Like a woman is not your sexual outlet right. and your husband is not your sexual outlet. And we can sin venially through lusting in marriage, uh, provided it's a, an appropriate sexual act. We can still sin by treating the other as an object. But I don't know how to reconcile that with the, if they lack self-control, get married. Yeah. I don't know. I want to try and think that through a bit more because anyway, maybe now's not the time to do it. But no, fair enough. I like what you said. 
that it's not like, well, I was going to be a priest, but I have no self-control. So, yeah. yeah and I also think um, like sexual depravity and sexual temptation has always existed. Mm. I mean, you have St. Paul saying things like, please stop it with the orgies. You know, that that was a thing. Yeah. I think it's the second letter of the Corinthians. And like uh, someone is sleeping with their mother-in-law and that's super gross. Yeah. I don't know the translation I was reading, but super gross. Super gross. And uh, like, ooh. Um, so it's always existed and yet it hasn't existed in the same ubiquitous sense that it exists today. And so, yeah, of course, you're going to be broken in some regard or have wounds from sins. But to think that that would disqualify you. I think would mean it would disqualify almost everybody. Yeah. Here's a here's an honest question for you. Like, uh, how do you reconcile? I mean, this this is a question I guess could be asked of me. Like, how who who do you think you are to marry this lovely woman when you're such a piece of crap? But like, how do you reconcile your own weaknesses and 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 inadequacies with this high calling of the priesthood? Because you don't want to fall into the sin of perfectionism. Or like dull your personality because you think it's not appropriate. Like you want to be you and the fullest version of you, to put it in a more kind of modern way. Um, but you're also aware of how presumably like unworthy you are of this calling. How does a man like reconcile his own unworthiness with the thing he's being called to? I think recognition of humility coming not in the way we expect it. That we are not the ones to judge our unworthiness. We can recognize our sinfulness and, well, maybe I'm just using the word wrong, but if Christ is calling you to something, hmm. he thinks you can do it. And it's, it's actually prideful for you to say, no, 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 hmm. I'm, not, I'm not good enough. I'm thinking of Peter in the boat. Get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Exactly. Yeah. And that's true of any religious vocation. It's also spousal. So it's it's not necessarily always you and I'm I'm worthy. Like celebration of the Eucharist. When those words are said, yes, it's you, your voice, your being saying them, but it's in persona Christi and it's mm -hmm. Christ saying them through you. And that applies to more than just that sacramental sense. So, yeah. so it doesn't, some senses, maybe, maybe the misjudgment of, of worthiness, but in some senses, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I love it. It doesn't that. matter if you're worthy. Even on a human level. Like if I'm dating my wife and I want to marry her and she thinks that she's made too many mistakes and she's like, no, I can't. I just, I'm not. I'd be like, shut up. Like, I don't care. Like, I want you. Mm -hmm. I want you. Like, this is less about you and more about me. I want you. Right. And I guess that's kind of what happens in the priesthood, huh? Christ yeah. is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm very aware of how wretched you are. Way yeah. more aware of it than yeah, you exactly. are. Yeah, exactly. But I want you. I want you. That's it. Mm. That's good. Did you say you had a question, Neil? Uh, well, there's one earlier I wanted to bring up, uh, which I don't know if you, it sounds like you might know him. Noah Doyle says, greeting from Zionsville. We miss you, Edom, and are so proud. And later he said, uh, also, uh, Edom, we called it, and then a smiley face. We what? I don't know if that means anything to you. We called it. Thaddeus says, tell him that his friends are all inspired and listening fervently to him. Yeah, my what dorm's uh, having a watch party right now. Oh, uh, really? That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. What people are very influential in your road to closeness with Christ, said Thaddeus. Priests, 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 priests. Get to know good, holy priests. Get to know them outside of just shaking hands after mass, hang out with priests. If they invite you for a bonfire at the rectory, go hang out with them, see their humanity. Mm -hmm. I've seen a priest play the banjo. That's cool. <laughs> I've seen a priest smoke meats on a grill. That's cool. I'm thinking these are, yes, these are priests and they're doing something else, but also they're men and they're cool. And I want to be like that. Yeah. Uh, absurd scandal says what's the relation between detachment from stuff you enjoy in poverty and also being free to enjoy the things you like which is a good thing in scripture as it comes to you so in in some of the spiritual guides on mortification so mm -hmm. the monks some of the monks who engage in heavy fasting if someone comes to their gates and brings them a feast they don't say no 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 i'm fasting uh -huh. they will engage in it because yeah. 
treat everything as if the Lord brings it to you. Yeah. So if you're with your friends and depending on, on guidance of your spiritual director, you were going to fast for a meal and there's some event or they invite you to eat with them or whatever. It's, it's awkward for you to sit there with no plate and, and look at all your friends yeah, eating food. Very cringy. Yeah. Yeah. Cringy. Please don't do that. Yeah. So situational awareness. Yeah. Okay. Why isn't Adam says Kate in the priestly discernment program on campus? How does he suggest discerning outside of that? I knew this one would come. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, yeah. So first I'll start by saying the PDP on campus is great. There are a lot of great guys in the program. Uh, Father Jonathan is a wonderful man. Holy great guys that are disciplined and really care and love the Lord. And that's, that's full stop. However, in my time in the priestly discernment program, one of the first things we learned, um, or what, okay. My first Thursday for Thursday night was formation night. We had a holy hour mm -hmm. in front of our Lord exposed in the Eucharist and we were singing. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm a silent adoration guy. I like that high contemplative stuff, but obviously music in front of our Lord. Fine. Great. Praise the Lord. And we're doing this. And then there's this guitar, this piano comes on and I kind of roll my eyes. Like I'm not, I'm not huge on piano and guitar praise music, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not like an instrumental uh, puritanism. I'll listen to Claire de Lune. It's a great piano piece. I love piano and guitar music all the time. But here we are in front of our Lord and everyone there is singing and I'm reading the lyrics. We get to this line of the hymn that says, when heaven meets earth like a wet sloppy kiss. Something in me just, mm, I don't, I don't love that. Okay. I don't love that. And then later on that evening, there was a, our formation was on, it was on like, what do you call it? Praise events when people are, are in these charismatic gift. Mm -hmm. um, so we were taught how to catch someone who is um, falling over, having falling been over. prayed over. Well, yeah. they call well, it resting in the spirit. I see. And my, my conversion or reversion, whatever you want to call it, was a lot of in my room doing research, yeah. talking to a priest. It's a different spirituality, so maybe. It's completely different. I see, yeah. So then when I go and I see people, you know, with this very expressive. outward expressive, it was just not comfortable for me. Sure. And that's not to say, I don't, I don't want to touch the theology of that. Yeah. I'm not a theologian. That's fine. I can't comment on that. But you weren't at home in that. I was not at home in that. Fair enough. And yeah. praise God, my vocations director right now is, he completely understands that. Yeah. And he's, he's cool with that. He agrees with me. And so my discernment is outside of this priestly discernment program. I mean, the fact that there are different religious orders and ways of being a priest is uh, admitting in a way that there are different spiritualities. I mean, some people are called to be monks alone mm -hmm. in their cells. Some people are called to be parish priests. Some people are called to embrace poverty more than others. And so that nah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the beastless 09K, probably not his real name, okay. says, I am currently in my RCIA class and have a long time before I can truly get hands on with discerning the consecrated life. Any tips for self-discipline and patience? It's going to be rough. I'm, I'm just going to say it. Exodus 90. Uh, no, no, I mean, not just that. The discipline to, to focus on where you are. So even in, in my, pro, like as an altar server, when I wasn't even confirmed, I would be thinking about, the the highest heights of sanctity in this saint story in this living life over here in this but you are what is present to you is the reality god has given you mm -hmm. dwelling in the past is not good that reality has gone and dwelling about possible futures or, or ruminating about possible futures is just a cause for anxiety demonic influence can work with with creating realities that don't exist and putting them in your mind and being stressed about something that's not present yet what is present is being in the moment god has given you yeah. So be present there. If you're an RCIA, be the best RCIA candidate you can be. Yeah, Don't start thinking wrong. about what I'm going to do after I'm I'm confirmed and then how I'm going to live my life. Right now, be the best that you can right now. When you go to Mass and hunger and thirst for the Eucharist, great, recognize that. 
don't start fantasizing about once I can receive and this is how I'm going to do this and that and that. Be where you are and be the best that you can where you are because God has given you that reality to contend with and that is plenty. That's enough. Yeah. That's exactly, I mean, it's a paraphrase of our Lord, right? Like uh, there are many, what does he say, troubles? Each day has its own trouble. Mm-hmm. Like today's enough. Yeah. Um, Andrew says, people might understand the diocesan priesthood and priests in parishes how you explain to others if you are called to be a hermit or even a hermit priest. Okay, so he's saying, I think, if you say I'm going to be a diocesan priest, people are like, okay, cool, mm-hmm. generally, maybe. But if you're like, I want to be a hermit, like what? So how do you explain that to people? I suppose I'll start by saying you don't need to explain everything to everyone. Yeah, Everyone has a right to understand why you do what you do. But if if genuinely you you do need an explanation, maybe maybe related to marriage. Everyone everyone understands marriage. Um, in order to say yes to your wife, you have to say no to every other female on earth. To give a more complete yes to yeah. Christ in an, a religious vocation, you have to say no to the world in a yeah. more complete sense. And that's that's about it. Every every choice for something is a negation of another, isn't it? It's an obvious point, but it's one that I keep coming back to and I keep getting fresh insight out of. Like to choose to do this podcast this morning is to choose to not do a multitude of other things that I could have been doing. Right. To sit back and say, well, therefore, if I won't choose anything, it's like, that's just, that's the mailman. That is just say, well, then you get nothing. So... Uh, Magdala says, can you please share whether you have some saints that are most important in your journey or who you feel inspired by? So St. Augustine has been in the background for a while. I haven't had a a huge devotion to him, Mm -hmm. but he's always kind of popped up here and there. (laughs) And now I'm in class and reading his confessions and it makes sense. We have a lot in common. But uh, my patron saint is, my confirmation saint is Saint Benedict Joseph Labor, L-A-B-R-E, okay. French saint. Uh, that That's, oh, Saint Therese. So, <laughs> it's a joke I make. The reason I can't discern with the D- Dominicans anymore is because I read Saint Therese's autobiography in one weekend. And then I wrote my letter to the Dominican vocations director in <laughs> Theresean English, I'll call it. Just this flowery, uh-huh. verbose. Uh, reading it is Friend. actually the the cringiest thing I've ever written. <laughs> this is the second cringiest thing you've ever written. Um, second chronologically, <laughs> but by far, by far at the top. All right. And so I, I actually can't show my face to a Dominican. Uh, <laughs> That's but amazing. I, it's like embarrassing yourself on a first date. I'm like, well, yeah. I'm not going back to that it's woman. Not, it's not the one. And I'm, I'm kidding. That's not why I, I didn't end up continuing my discernment with them, but. Have you just heard of the Carmelites out in Wisconsin, uh, Wyoming? Wyoming, yeah. They look so cool. They look very cool. I've heard <laughs> mixed things. Oh. I don't know if the things I've heard are, are true. I've heard that what I've heard that's bad isn't necessarily true. Oh. I don't know. Anyway. but It would be cool just to wear one thing for the rest of your life, wouldn't it? A just habit. like one habit. Yeah. It's like, this is my outfit now. Yeah. Very it's cool. like all those uh, movies where they uh, portray humans living on another planet. We're all wearing this one particular mm-hmm. spacesuit. Mm-hmm. It's like someone just decides, this is what we're doing now. That just must be a lot easier. Easy. Mm. But it's cool to have like the cassock and then like you, yeah. you, the flare it up a bit with the, the black the cape. The and the mm-hmm. cape, the ferraiolo and the saturno. Yeah, bring and all that the, back. Oh, bring that often, back. You know, if I, I often joke that like... Uh, when they elect me Pope uh, mm, after Francis, I'm going to look at someone right after they elect me. I'm like, where is the papal tiara? Run! <laughs> also, I'm going to need the keys to the apart to my, uh, what, did, what did Pope Francis the give papal, up? Uh, the papal apartments, something like whatever that. Whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to need that too. So my friends, <laughs> a funny, funny story. That's why I'm not going to be Pope. This is, this is a great example of the contrast in my conversion. So I have some, a running joke that I've had with, with a few of my friends from back home is about the, are you familiar with a do-rag? Yeah. So we had this uh, to wear idea of, oh, of course. Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why you said, of course, and I want to dig into that no, at some point. No, no, I mean, I can tell. Yeah. 
that quality of hair texture. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You had a needed do rag to cover it. We had a joke about the the papal do rag. Uh-huh. Uh, just a do rag, just adorned with <laughs> gold encrusted, <laughs> bedazzled, jeweled do rag. That would be cool. Yeah, sure. I'll take your word for it. That over a papal tiara any day. Really? No, I'm gonna need the tiara. What one piece of advice would you give to somebody discerning the priesthood right now who hasn't yet joined the seminary or maybe hasn't even reached out, but get people to pray for you. Mm. My goodness. If you if you can't pray for yourself or if you're struggling with sin and you're weak, get people to pray for you. I am Catholic because of the prayers of others. Mm. I am where I am because of the prayers of others. It's it's a community religion and you sitting in your room studying canon law or reading the general instruction of the Roman Missal is as not cool do it. as it is. As cool as it is, <laughs> not gonna do it. And if you Good. are where I was and sometimes still am and you're crippled, whether it's by by mental health or by sin or whatever, and you just you just can't. Some days you just can't mm-hmm. get people to pray for you. And take and a mental health there. Sorry. Take, <laughs> take a mental health there. <laughs> Uh, Eden, uh, Adam, could you explain the culture of the diocese of Steubenville? I hear people constantly joining religious orders, but the diocese itself only has five seminarians. I don't know. You don't have to feel like you're an expert on every topic. I Maybe, don't. I don't yeah. know much about the diocese of Steubenville at all. Quite honestly, I'm I'm just here hanging out. Absurd scandal says, would it would it true would it be true to say holy orders is blessing and pleasure? Just as Mary viewed her rearing Christ as a favor for her. I have no idea what's happening in that comment. I'd like to apologize if I misunderstood it, but uh, we're going to just abandon ship right okay. there. All right. All right. So what's the next step for you? As the next wrap- step for me yeah. is my diocesan vocations director, Father Aaron. Great guy. He, when he is determined that I am ready. Okay. When we determine that the call from the Lord is authentic Mm -hmm. he will give me the application for seminary and i'm sure the bishop is involved in there somewhere don't know those official details are you in your undergrad right now i'm yes and and would you finish your undergrad or would you just i don't know i i would they want you to i think that's probably a more practical solution Mm -hmm. i am ready to jump in open arms to the seminary (laughs) But so I'm also cool. practicing the virtue of patience. So, do you know other men in the seminary right now? Oh yeah, yeah, I know some some fantastic seminarians. Yeah, I'm really hopeful for our next generation because yeah. it is it is men who are willingly taking on huge risk, taking on yeah burden to sacrifice for others. Like hearing you're going to jump in to a burning building and saying, "Let's do it." <laughs> Bring it. Bring it. <laughs> We've got a really strong generation of priests coming up. Mm-hmm. Good. Let's say a Hail Mary. Amen. And we'll offer it for you and for everyone right now discerning the priesthood. And maybe I'll pray the first half and you can pray the second. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Vianney, pray Pray for for us. us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Adam, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. And hi to the watch party in... Francis Hall. Francis Hall. What's Mm -hmm. up with you? Cool. Thanks.